Okay, we're moving on now. Our, our next speaker is the Chief Security and Privacy Officer with Huawei Technologies, and he's here today to talk about the um, IFT, the Internet of Things, or the um, I of Everything, the Internet of Every Danger. So if you could give a warm round of applause to Mr. Pierre Noel. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good morning. First, the good news. I have absolutely nothing to sell. I'm just here to share information. I'm a practitioner. I'm a security officer. I have been in this business for about 30 years. So what I'm here to, going to do is really share information with you. I'm not going to end up by saying we have a solution because that is not true. One thing you need to understand when it comes to IoT, there is no IoT security expert today. We are all learning one page at a time. Nobody can claim to have expertise on IoT security. That is not true. Because we are still looking at the dynamic of IoT and trying to figure out what it means and the implication. I assume you all understand who Huawei is. We are Fortune 129, I think. We make around 80 billion US dollars revenue, 180,000 people, uh, full-fledged employees within the organization. If you add the non-full-fledged employees, we've got roughly 250,000 employees worldwide. Prior to joining Huawei, I was CSO for another organization, very big organization as well. And about two years ago, I've been asked by the press, what keeps you awake at night? Without a second beat, I answered IoT. IoT is what kept me awake at night. Because even two years ago, we could figure out that things were not under control. And things are getting slightly worse right now. I am not here to say this is the end of the world, that the end of the world is coming and we will be doomed. That's not at all the point. I just want to share with you what we perceive to be the reality of the risks so that we have our eyes wide open and we take these risks into account for whatever strategy we decide to have. Let me press. Yeah. One thing that worries me a lot is when we embark into new technology, you always have someone to say, hmm, if it doesn't work, we can back off, you know. So let's, let's go IoT. If it doesn't work, we can back off. This is not true. I've been thinking, and again and again, I've been in this business 30 years, as I said. I have never seen a single case of someone backing off from a technology. It does not happen. We don't back off. Doesn't work? Okay, thank you, sir. We don't back off. We usually try to understand the risks and we go ahead. Sometimes we have the swing of the pendulum. We have seen the swing of the pendulum between mainframe, servers, smart, smartphones, and now we're going to cloud. You know, keeping my data under control in a data center, keeping my data close to me, then moving my data to the cloud. This is a swing of the pendulum. This is not backing off. It's, it's looking at new technologies, look at the, opportunity, the opportunities associated with these new technologies, and jumping. So one thing I want to make very clear, it is my strong belief that IoT will not disappear, even if tomorrow someone finds a significant security problem with IoT. It's here to stay. Cloud is also here to stay. It's not going to disappear for the very same reason. So let's not work on the assumption that if we find a problem, IoT will disappear. Not true. How many people, and, and I had first-hand experience on that, people who said, oh, yes, we are using email right now, but if the email system goes down, we can always revert back to fax. No. After a few years of utilizing emails for your business interaction, people have disconnected the facts. No, you cannot revert back to facts. So let's take that for what it is. IoT is here to stay, and we will have to make do with whatever security issues we might get with IoT. Yeah. Yeah. 
I decided to look only at three different dimensions of IoT. I could have covered more, but these ones are somewhat relevant. Smart home, which is the consumer IoT. Automotive, automotive not in the sense of hacking a Tesla, which was very interesting, by the way. Much more self-driving vehicles and what it will mean in the future when these uh, cars will have to communicate with each other, exchange information to avoid incident, but at the same time make sure that the information exchange does not create a privacy issue. So, fascinating topic. And then industry control. Deployment of smart meters, deployment of, of, of sensors on pipeline, you know, all these kind of uh, IoTs that are, carried, that are associated with industries. So, let's cover these three uh, topics, and let's look at what are the risks. Some of the risks have happened already. Some of the risks are being talked about. None of the risks I will explain today do not exist in one way or another at the moment. They all exist. Either they have happened, either I know some people who are working on it at the moment. First, to understand the risks, we need to have a pretty good understanding on the threat landscape. Who would have an interest to attack and why? When we understand the threat landscape, we have a much better perspective on the reality of the risks, the potential of the risks, the likelihood of the risks. I somewhat make it simple. I subdivide the threat landscape into three driving forces. We've got people who have a keen interest to attack IoTs because they want to make money out of it. This is what I call the organized crime, the mafia, the yakuza, the triads of this world. This is by far the most prominent team of people building this kind of attacks nowadays. And these people make a lot of money out of it, and they anticipate to make a lot more money when IoT will be deployed. These people, have absolutely no interest to hack you. They don't care about hacking you. Their sole interest is to make money. And so you have many ways to make money without even hacking someone. And so you, when you look at your IoT, you have to think in terms of how could people monetize from it? And then you see that the different types of attack can happen, which are not the real type of attack you would usually talk about. Then you have government, cyber warfare. Over my many years, I have dealt with a lot of these people. I have very good relationship with many of them. And I can say that they are OK. It's, they play by the book. They have their own set of rules. We know what we can anticipate. We know what they will not do. These people are not silly. We have few countries that are dangerous, very dangerous. But by and large, everything you hear about cyber warfare, it's OK. They play by the rule. So I'm less worried about this one. They're very shrewd, very clever. Some countries are extremely clever in the way you use cyber as a way to create chaos or as a way to distract people. Very clever. But by and large, this is the team I'm less worried about at the moment. And then you have people who would attack you because they are motivated by beliefs. Some belief could be lightweight. Some belief could be very heavy. Lightweight belief is... Um, I don't like people who smoke, and I'm going to attack you because you smoke. I don't like people who wear a red tie, and I will attack you because you have a red tie. More serious beliefs are people like Daesh. You know, they want to attack you, it's terrorism. They, these people worry me a lot. They worry me a lot, but not yet. It is commonly understood that they have not yet been able to acquire the depth of expertise that it takes to be able to mount real attack. Once they will get that depth of expertise, I'm worried. Because they, they don't care about killing people, and they know there won't be retaliation. The reason why a country does not easily do a cyber attack against another country, it's because there is retaliation. I know who did it, you have a capital, I can attack you back. Terrorists, they don't have a capital. There is no possibility for retaliation. So they are more free to make an attack than government. So they don't have the knowledge today. We anticipate it might still take a year before they, are, they, they collect the right knowledge, but they can still buy knowledge from uh, the organized crime communities. Because the organized crime communities will give you whatever they have for a price. Now, let's have fun. What could go wrong? 
Well, let's look at smart, at smart home. You know, these intelligent cameras, these smart watches, you have all these things that uh, you own as a consumer. From the very easy, very um, understandable burglar, you have a smart lock, someone could hack the smart lock and get into your, your house. Easy. Ransom. Someone could threaten you or effectively start to be a pest, turning on, turning off your light, turning on your, your audio, your video, turning it off, so that you become crazy. And they will say, I will stop if you give me $20. $20 is less what it would cost you to replace all your devices, so you're willing to pay $20, or perhaps even $40. So they have a very good understanding on how much to ask and not to ask, not not to ask too much, so that they can monetize. So we see that a lot. DDoS, denial of service attack, we have seen that attack taking place a few months ago where intelligent cameras got hacked and they were used to attack uh, some other uh, sites. We will see a lot of these because the security associated with these devices is non-existent. So it's, it's so easy. It's absolutely so easy. Theft. Theft of data can happen at two levels. The typical level is some people could steal your private data, use them, or sell them. In some countries, this is a big worry. In some other countries, people don't care. You go to China, and I tell people I'm going to steal your data, so what? They don't care. So it's, it's not a threat that is meaningful everywhere in the world. It has, it has a component of culture associated with it. However, Extortion is much more juicy, if you will. I can make significantly more money on extortion. Extortion is, I'm going to steal private data for a given type of device. For example, I'm going to start recording uh, all these images generated by this intelligent camera. I record everything, I store everything, and then I contact uh, the company that makes these cameras, and I say, you're going to run out of business, because I'm going to publish all these images that I have been able to capture, and then, Reputation will be so bad, you will die. Unless you pay me 10,000 bitcoins, of course. So we see a lot of this extortion. Extortion is one of these very shrewd, clever way the organized crime communities are using to monetize. They don't attack you, they threaten to attack you. And very often, even as the CEO of an organization, you don't know if you are vulnerable or not. And sometimes they will give you some evidence that they succeeded in attacking you. Can you make the risk? Can you really call the bluff? Or should you pay? It's, it's beautiful. As an attack, it's really, really clever. Cyber warfare. When it comes to cyber warfare, it's not always a matter of attacking a nuclear plant or disrupting banks in a country. It's sometimes a matter of creating chaos. Chaos is good in cyber warfare. So, if I can wait long enough for enough people in a country to use a certain type of IoT device, and I'm, I have a, a vulnerability on that device, I could threaten to make an attack, or I could use the press in an intelligent way so that people will start understanding there is a risk with that device, and people will be frantic. That will create chaos. Some countries have a strong interest in doing that, sometimes because they want to disrupt your economy, sometimes because they want to distract you. They want you to look there while they're doing something here. Very clever. So we see that. Internet of vehicles. Like I said, these days when we speak about IOV, we speak about, could someone hack my Tesla? Someone has been able to remotely hack a Jeep Cherokee, and, and all these kind of things. This is important. But again, if you stand in my shoes, you look at it and you wonder, who could monetize from that? The only way you can monetize if you're a bad guy is by doing an attack, showing that the attack exists, and then extortion against Jeep, extortion against General Motors, extortion against Tesla. That is the way I monetize. Attacking a car on its own is useless. I don't make money out of that. But making use of that as an extortion mean very clever. So what can we see? What do we see? People could unlock your car and alarm system, exactly what has been explained earlier. People could threaten to modify your vehicle's behavior unless you pay. Again, extortion, extortion against one person. And again, they will not ask too much money. It's just that it's a nuisance. It's not too much money for you. Perhaps it's $50, 50 euro, 
and perhaps it's only $10 in China, just enough for you to pay to get rid of that nuisance. They make good money out of that. They could steal your private data, use them or sell them. They could steal all private data emanating from vehicles and ask money to the data controller. That is the one that worries me. You, we are talking about Internet of Vehicles, you know. We are talking about smart vehicles that would drive by themselves. Well, smart vehicles that drive by themselves have to communicate internally and externally. They have to share a lot of information with other vehicles so that they know which vehicle is coming at which speed, where the risks are. Because you share so much information, you obviously have a security threat and a privacy threat. Someone could capture all this information and learn a great deal about all the drivers or about the behavior of these drivers. Think about GDPR, which is this regulation coming into force next year across Europe. If someone were able to steal this information, that probably would be a violation against GDPR. So people would be willing to pay extortion money so that that doesn't happen. Again, there are ways to make good money for these bad guys. This information. I could announce via a tweet or anything that uh, all the Porsche uh, have a major bug, and I can, with a switch of a button, have all these Porsche running AVOC. What's going to happen? Today, nothing will happen. In two to three years from now, when IOV will become more mainstream, this will have an impact. So I can make use of that to create chaos again. And that would be of great interest for some countries. Some countries are really looking at that all the time. How can I possibly create chaos in case something happens, in case my relationship with that country goes south? What could I do to create chaos? Assassination, right. I haven't really seen that one. I haven't heard anyone proposing it yet on, 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 on the dark net, but I believe someone will do it. Just a matter of time, someone will say, I can, I can kill anyone who is driving a car that has blah. And, and for that much money. Cyber warfare, disrupting all self-driving vehicles, create chaos. Again, think about five years from now. All these vehicles, self-driving vehicles, working under a big mesh, a big cloud, if I disrupt that cloud, if I disrupt this communication channel, and if the fallback is not very good, if the resilience is not very good, what happens? Blue. Or perhaps blue will not happen, but the threat that something bad could happen is enough to worry government, is enough to worry uh, organizations, so that in one end they could pay, or on the other end they could be distracted. Again, we are not talking about people just doing an attack. We are talking about people creating chaos and, and being beneficiary of this chaos. Industry IoT. I had this, I had this case. Two cases, electricity smart meter, not in Europe, not with Huawei. It was before my, my time with Huawei. Bad guys, well, there is a country that has deployed electricity smart meters all over. The prime minister in that country, he's no longer prime minister right now, the prime minister in that country claimed that he was very green and he was really pushing for green. Some bad guys hacked into the smart meter database. They found out the bill for the prime minister, and they found out that he was spending a lot more electricity than that he should normally do if he were green. And so they made use of that information to, to start an attack against the guy. I mean, disparaging attack. It's a very nice attack, very good one. Again, smart meter. Some people found a bypass against the database that collects all the smart meter information, so they could identify these houses in very nice posh areas, these houses that were not occupied because the electricity consumption was very low. That would give them indication that the people were on holiday, so they could attack, they could, they could steal, they could burglar that house, which they did, of course. So, again, good utilization of uh, industry IoT, if you will. I had this case, you, I don't know if you know about it. I, I love it. I should not say that, but I love it. It was so shrewd. And IoT will make it even simpler. A pharmaceutical company. You know, pharmaceutical company rely on collecting data from their research, from their tests. They rely on that data for two reasons. Number one, because they want to understand the effectiveness of that medicine they're creating. And number two, for a regulatory reason. 
they have to keep that information so that they can answer any questions the regulator might have. One day, the bad guys came to the senior executive in that pharmaceutical company and said, you know what? This big database you have that is related to this big new medicine that you're going to release, well, I made modification into it. But I'm not going to tell you where, unless you pay me 10,000 bitcoins, of course. It's a fascinating situation. If you are the CEO of that organization, you're not threatened by a real attack. You're threatened by a demand of extortion. And you have to figure out whether what this guy is telling you is true or not. Has this attack really taken place? Have they really modified my database or not? If they modify the database, pay. You have to pay. You really have to pay because the risk is too high for you. If they have not modified the database, you should not pay. You should call the bluff. How sure are you that your security is so good that they did not succeed in penetrating your environment? Many, many organizations, not only pharmaceutical, I had cases with um, hospitals, I had cases with uh, oil and gas, I had cases with banks, several cases with banks. They received this threatening call. I managed to hack your system. Give me money and I will tell you what I did. But perhaps the guy has not hacked the system. When you have IoT, this will become mainstream. You will see exponentially more. Because when you have IoT, every IoT device is a potential entry point. It's a potential way for you to go back to the data. So unless you're really on top of your game, unless you can really say, no, 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 I've got the best security team, I'm using best practice, we know it's not possible, then you can call the bluff. Otherwise, you have to consider paying. When it comes to IoT, we should not look only, how much time do I have? Two minutes. When it comes to IoT, we should not only look at the device per se. IoT is an ecosystem. In an IoT ecosystem, I've got the device that needs to be protected. I've got the communication channel that needs to be protected. And I've got the receiving hand, most likely big data or related. So IoT security is a matter of IoT security, cloud security, and big data security. Because you cannot just secure the device and hope that your, your big data system will be protected. As a bad guy, I will look at all the, the ecosystem, and I will determine the, the weak point, and I will attack at the weak point. So just protecting the device is far from enough. Why do we have a security risk? If I wear my pure security hat, I've got a problem with IoT devices because I'm working into undefined perimeter. What is the perimeter of my device? I mean, it's, in some cases, Internet of Vehicles or smartwatch, it's a moving target. It's mobile, it's truly mobile. I am in a hostile environment. I worked with Microsoft. You know Microsoft does Xbox. Xbox was considered as a very special system because it, it is a machine that needs to be protected against a hostile environment. Because the people who could hack the Xbox could be the owner of the Xbox. So you really have to self-protect this machine to the extreme and make no assumption that this machine is in a safe environment. IoT is the same. My IoT device could be in any place, safe or unsafe. I cannot make any assumption. These devices use different technologies, different protocols. They are used for different purposes. You don't have a silver bullet that will fix your security issue. The issues that need to be addressed, and I'm finished, just two more slides that will be quick. The issues that need to be addressed from a technical angle, how can I make sure the device is really what it claims to be? And by the way, this device has got such a small footprint that you don't come talk to me about PKI. It does not have the memory, the CPU, or the battery for PKI. So I need to have another mechanism, yet make sure that this device is really what it claims to be. Conversely, I have to make sure that the server is what it claims to be. I had cases where the, the, the devices started feeding meaningful information to a server that was not the real server. You know, you just change the DNS, you corrupt the DNS, you change the address if these devices speak IP, and all the information goes to a server. And if the device doesn't do basic authentication, you're dead. Patch management. I'm buying a light bulb from XYZ, 
And then we find out that this light bulb has got some, some vulnerability into its software. How do I update the software on that light bulb? Most of these devices do not have any patch management mechanism. They work on the assumption that the software is perfect, will never have to be updated. Wrong. This is the quote from a very good people on IoT security. IoT systems introduce a large number of vulnerabilities as each single device represents a potential risk and a potential attack vector. Welcome to my world. How do we address this? Three big pictures. First, those of you who are old enough, you might remember that many years ago we spoke about the OSI network, and there was a competition between the IP network and the OSI network. On theory, OSI was magnificent. The OSI network was beautiful, well-designed, and everything. It lost. IP won, because IP was simple, easy to use. So I, what I'm trying to say here, experience tells us that any sophisticated solution that tries to address every problem in a systematic way doesn't work. People like to go for quick and dirty. So, the solution, understanding human being and human behavior, is probably to look at a TCP IP equivalent to IoT security, not a big picture, because nobody will implement it. The second one, have your eyes wide open. Of course you should use IoT. If you are part of an organization that looks at deploying IoT, of course you should do it, but understand the risks. It's okay. Like driving a car is okay. Yes, you could die if you drive a car, but if you know the risk and if you know the best practice, you can drive your car safely. Same for IoT, but you have to have your eyes wide open. Understand what the risks are, understand how you can mitigate, and which risk you have to tolerate. The last one, I strongly believe, when you look at IoT, the consumer IoT is the difficult one. We cannot expect consumers who are not technically savvy to be able to understand whether this intelligent camera is secure or not, whether this smartwatch is secure or not. We have to help them. I strongly believe that the way to address that is probably through public-private partnership in the context of Europe with the European Union, you know, where the, the, the security experts would work with the governments so that we could come up with some certification, some best practice, and ensure that only people passing this certification criteria could sell the IoT consumer devices to the market in Europe. A little bit like when you use an electricity uh, component in Europe, you know that all these electricity have been certified. You have a standard certification, same if you use toys and whatnot. My personal belief is that we should go that way because we cannot anticipate consumers to be able to, to understand what IoT security is or is not. On the enterprise level, that's your problem. You have to understand the risk. You have to have a team that can address it. And that's my last slide here. What can we do? First, you need to have secure supply chain. Do not buy from someone you cannot trust. And don't trust a person just because he's having a good look. Ask nasty questions. Ask for people if they, if they meet some basic criteria on security. Do they do secure development life cycle? Do they themselves have a secure um, a supply chain? Do they abide to some basic standards? Yes, no. That, that's a first point. Don't buy from people you cannot trust. You have to do your threat and risk landscape analysis. The problem I have right now with IoT, very often within an organization, the people buying IoT are not under the purview of IT. And usually the security expertise is with IT. So you buy your IoT stuff, you, de you deploy your IoT stuff, and nobody is able to do a security review or threat analysis because the IT people are focused on the IT stuff. So there's a problem here. We address that problem by putting accountability. Everything that carries a cybersecurity or privacy risk should be under the purview of a cybersecurity team within the organization. Within IT or outside of IT, someone must be accountable to make sure that that stuff we bring on board is made secure. Secure development life cycle for what you develop and what you buy, you have to make sure it has been developed following basic best practice, uh, practice, uh, best practice um, standards. Microsoft SDL is a good one. It became an ISO standard not that long ago. I don't know if we have time. He has time for one question. By the way, uh, airline have not been hacked yet. I happen to sit on the board of, uh, of Airbus. It has not yet happened, and we believe it will not happen.
Okay. Why do you believe it will not happen? Because it's been designed by people who had security in mind for a long time, so it's been correctly designed. But what about the German wings flight, for example? I mean, that was a, a human being who was able to do that. Are, are, if we weren't able to prevent a human from crashing a plane, how can we prevent hackers from it? I can make sure at the moment, unless someone comes with a brilliant idea that nobody has thought about, I can make sure that it's not possible to remotely attack the avionic of a plane. You cannot, unless you, you are physically in front of the avionic, you cannot remotely plant okay. uh, something on the avionic. And what about a pilot <laughs> doing it? I mean, let, yes. let's, okay. He's physically in front, yes. <clears throat> oh yeah, and he's human. And uh, what about the, uh, the notion, and I asked uh, the speaker before, if you have pilots who are in the cockpit and they put the plane on autopilot mm -hmm. at that moment, and you, and you have that for long haul flights all the time, mm -hmm. is, is the autopilot mode, is that more susceptible to a hacker than it would be if the pilot is in control? I think I would be more worried about the human in control in that case. The autopilot has been pretty well designed for a long time. So to answer your question in a blunt way, okay. less risk with the autopilot at the moment, unless proven otherwise. So people remain the weakest Always. link. Always. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Mr. Noel, thank you very much. And I hope you're right about the planes. Uh -huh. Yeah? Let's give him a hand, thank everybody. Thank you.